Nick here, M0NTV, and welcome back to my shack for another, the last um, of 2022 homebrew video. And uh, yeah, welcome. Thanks for uh, for joining me. And uh, what I want to do today, and apologies for the, if you can hear that chainsaw. <laughs> Somebody's going mad with a chainsaw around here. It's quite disturbing um, uh, in a garden over there. So apologies if you can hear that. But what I want to do today. Um, is just to update you really on this direct conversion receiver that I built in the last video. And if you haven't watched that, you might want to go and watch that first. Um, because what I built was an all analog, all discrete component direct conversion receiver. So, um, so no ICs, no microcontrollers, you know, um, all, all analog and all um, transistors really. Uh, so yeah, um, I've changed it <laughs> basically. So um, uh, in conversation with other people and playing around with it, trying to optimize it and get it the best I can. In fact, I've changed a lot of it. The only two bits I've not changed are the bandpass filter and the actual glue stick PTO, permeability tuned oscillator. And if you want to know about that, then that's two videos ago. Um, but other than that, Everything else has been changed, and um, and the reason why I started changing, first of all, was was Bill Mira, um, uh, N2 CQR, contacted me and said, uh, "Nick, it looks great." He says, "But um, have you suffered with AM breakthrough?" And I said, "It's funny you should ask that." I said, "Because yeah, I have. Uh, yeah, really, really bad." Um, and uh, uh, not all the time, but then the, the AM station is not all all the time, but. This side of the pond, um, just north of our UK allocation, 7.2 megahertz on the 40 meter band, we've got a lot of very powerful shortwave broadcast stations that come from mainland Europe. And when they fire up, um, yeah, I was hearing their signals bleed across the entire 40 meter band because I was using um, this little product detector which, uh, as you probably remember, is designed by my friend Pete Giuliano, um, N6QW, um, and uh, it's really uh, a circuit for a dual-gate MOSFET. And what Pete did is he used these um, uh, two J310s uh, uh, as though they were one uh, dual-gate MOSFET. And it worked really well, and it sounds great, but it's, it's susceptible to this AM breakthrough. And I thought, well, maybe I need to tweak it or build it better or whatever. But I did a bit of research, quite a bit of research on this. And it seems that ever since people have been putting dual gate MOSFETs into product detectors, they've been complaining about this. And it seems it seems to be a fairly inherent issue with, with this design. And I'm not sure uh, well, you probably need a bigger brain than me anyway to uh, to, to fix that. So I'm um, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do much more with that. It, it's great, but um, yeah, it, it's got uh, it's not as good as it could be. So um, Bill suggested that I went back to the tried and trusted uh, diode ring mixer, um, and I've put these in just about every uh, transceiver that I've built. So I built another one um, identical to to this one put that in. It helped. Um, I certainly wasn't getting as much AM breakthrough, but I was still getting some. But actually, um, putting that to one side, we'll come back to that for a minute. I had another problem, which was the whole radio didn't work. <laughs> Once I put this in, I was just getting nothing. Like, what's going on here? And then I remembered, of course, um, my glue stick PTO didn't put out very much power, so I'll I'll um I'll I'll show you now what what I did about that. So here is my glue stick PTO, which I run. Although it it, it has nine volts coming into it, um, it's regulated down to six volts, so it doesn't run very uh, high, and it doesn't put out much power. Now, when I was using that active um, dual gate MOSFET product detector that didn't matter because of all the amplification inherent in that 
uh, uh, product detector. I didn't need to put out very much power, but of course, swapping that to a passive uh, diode ring mixer, uh, which actually um, has a loss, you know, um, uh, not a gain, um, I just wasn't getting enough power from this PTO to drive my um, my diode ring mixer. So I need to do something about that. So um, those diode ring mixers usually need about at least 7 dBm to drive them, and I was nowhere near. So what I did, I thought, well, I need a buffer amplifier. So I happen to have lying around one of these um, Wes Haywood Bob Kopsky uh, termination insensitive amplifiers that I've built. And again, I've got a video on building that if you're interested. Um, and uh, that put out more than enough uh, power. In fact, if you can see on the end here, so it's a bit dark, but um, I actually put a little pi attenuator on the end there just to take it down to the uh, required drive level. Uh, and the great thing about that, of course, is that it will uh, make sure that that um, the uh, the the diode ring mixer will see a good fifty ohms uh, termination as well on that port, and that's um, that's really useful. So um, so that was good. So I so I fitted the the buff ramp, uh, connected it in, and uh, and the radio uh, let back into life, um, but it still wasn't very powerful. I wasn't hearing as much and, and hearing things as loudly as as I was uh, with the active mixer. So I thought it's, it still needs a bit of work and I was still getting some AM breakthrough. So, um, you know, I'd, I'd kind of taken a step forward, but then a couple of steps backwards as well. So the next thing I turned my attention to was the audio amplifier. So now... Just to remind you, the audio amplifier I was using is a design by W8DIZ, which was published in Sprat uh, a while ago, as, and, and he called it his uh, generic audio amplifier. And um, yeah, it works, uh, works really well. It's just um, uh, four uh, transistors um, and two, uh, two N3904s and two two and three nine oh six is um and uh, two of them in a complementary pair in the in the kind of power amplifier stage but it doesn't put out a lot um ignore that transformer that was an experiment that's not actually in circuit so um yeah now actually so now uh, pete giuliano n6qw sent me an email as well um separate to this and said um one thing he tried when he built one very similar to this uh, a while ago um, was to swap out that last complementary pair. Instead of putting um, a 2N3904 and a 2N3906, is to swap them out for a TIP 31C and a TIP 32C. Now, these are audio power transistors, right? So they're going to give you much more power, and that's what Pete found. So I thought, well... Rather than, than butcher this thing, I'll just build another one. So I actually found Pete's design, um, uh, and I'll link to, to Pete's design on, on, his, on his website so you can see it for, for yourself, um, and did exactly what he suggested and, and swapped those uh, transistors uh, over, and I'll show you what that looks like. Right, so this is what I built second time round. Uh, and you can see those uh, power transistors on the on the right hand side there, and uh, as I said, I'll link to uh, to the schematic on Pete's website. But um, now that certainly gave me a lot more power and doesn't draw a lot more current. Actually, it was it's um, yeah very good. So um, so that was good. So that was definitely staying, and that was giving me more um, amplification. Now bear in mind the only amplification at the moment. Is, is in the audio stage. So really, you know, I needed to get as much out of that as I could, really. So um, so that definitely helped. So I was hearing stations louder now um, than, than I was before. Um, but I'd still got this pesky AM breakthrough. Um, and that's when I needed uh, to, uh, to revisit something which again, I've done a video on before, which is uh, the wonderful world of the diplexer. 
Now, when I've made diplexes before, and I make them quite a lot, they've all been RF frequency diplexes. That is to say, they've largely been something I've put on either end of my IF section in my superhead um, format transceiver. So essentially what they're doing is, is making sure that uh, at the, the mixers on either end, basically only one's a product detector, but the mixers on either end of the IF section, you know, one at the front is making sure that only the IF frequency goes into the IF section and everything else gets shunted to ground and it all sees 50 ohms and they're exactly the same on the other end right so and, and that's what I've done but and someone commented actually I, I should have taken more notice of this but when I did that video on the uh, diving deeper into the diplexer about what about an audio diplexer and I and I commented back to them at the time I think that I'd never really thought that I would need that because, you know, it's an audio port and generally when you're at audio frequencies, you know, matching impedances is not so critical as is RF. Generally, you just want to make sure that you're not loading down the stage before. So you want to put your, your signal into a much higher impedance. But what I'd neglected is that it doesn't matter what you call these ports, you know, so whether your, your port is... Um, uh, an IF port, or whether actually it's, it's serving as a product detector and you're taking audio out and possibly in to there if you're using it as a modulator, then if it wants to see 50 ohms, then it wants to see 50 ohms, right? You know, no matter what frequency the signal is that you're taking out or putting into it. And I really hadn't taken that seriously. Um, and what um, uh, Bill suggested is that I look at the design that Roy Llewellyn, W7EL uh, had designed a, a transceiver and on his product detector he included a very simple audio diplexer which was really a, a glorified low pass filter that just allows the you know the, the lower audio signals to go through and, and shunting everything else to ground but he had a 51 ohms resistor in there um, capacitively coupled as well so that um, the port would see 50 ohms and uh, and I'll show you um, my little um, schematic of this I think it's an LT spy simulation that I did um, which is taken from uh, you know uh, Roy's much larger um, schematic of his of his whole transceiver this is Roy Llewellyn's audio diplexer uh, it's very very simple and as uh, you can see here, um, it's this is actually a one milli Henry choke. He, I think he used a, a hundred micro Henrys. Um, all the only difference is um, is that it it moves the the knee as it's called of the filter uh, up and down a bit depending on how high or low you make this amount of inductance. And by uh, making it higher you're actually cutting off, um, uh, you're lowering the, the knee in the, uh, the low pass filter. So you, you're, you're filtering more stuff out, which seemed to be a, a good thing really. So mine shelves off about 10 um, kilohertz. So um, yeah, and, and so basically it's a glorified low pass filter, um, which I've I built before many times, but the, the real genius is just the addition of this 51 ohms resistor here. Um, and uh, so it, it's it's very simple. It's really just that 10 nanofarad 51 ohm resistor, one milli Henry, uh, 825 was just the actual actual amount of my choke, which was a bit under, but that was absolutely fine. Um, 470 nanofarad capacitor here and a, three, a 33 microfarad uh, electrolytic capacitor there and this just simulates a 1k load which would be your audio preamp which probably will be a lot higher than that but that, that's fine but this circuit uh, when I added this to the uh, the double balanced diode ring mixer made an amazing difference it killed all of the AM breakthrough completely cured it which was fantastic um, 
and even I did some tests using the uh, the, the mixer as a uh, uh, as a modulator as as well, and actually injected an audio signal into it, and and so and actually gave me superb carrier suppression, far better carrier suppression with with the diplexer. Um, than without and again I guess it's this business of this 51 ohms termination um, so yeah so that was a really uh, uh, great discovery and that way solved my uh, issue of the uh, of the AM breakthrough and really the last part of this story um, was the fact that it was all working I cured the AM breakthrough I still wasn't getting quite as much oomph in it really and I, I think well I'm probably going to need some kind of RF preamp even though it's for 40 meters um, sometimes having a preamp there can help the noise figure uh, as well so I thought well I don't need loads again but I need a bit so I was playing around with with RF preamps it needed to be low noise and I thought well I'll have a try um, since I'm doing all things JFET at the minute of building a grounded gate JFET RF preamp. Now here's one which is built uncharacteristically in ugly construction and that's because I've had a, an, a, an email exchange with the living legend himself Mr Wes Haywood recently W7ZOI I was a bit starstruck um, but um, uh, anyway we were talking about different things but he encouraged me to have a go at ugly construction of which he's a great proponent. I did confess to him that I'm a little bit too OCD to, to hack ugly construction but when as Awood himself tells you to give it a go I mean <laughs> you gotta kind of try right so so I did um, and it works perfectly well I still don't like it <laughs> I, I'm gonna need to be prized away from Manhattan style I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm too in love with the Manhattan style I think but it's quick and it's working. If you want to change something, yeah, it certainly does the job. You can't fault it. And this little circuit worked, um, but it didn't give me very much gain. Uh, and that's the thing. Uh, I was only really getting about less than 5 dB gain. Uh, I needed a bit more than that. Um, so I thought, well, what next? Well, in the end, I fell back onto a tried and trusted circuit, which I will show you now. So here we have um, a wonderful design by SV1AFN and I've used a few of his designs. Now he has his own website, I'll link uh, to, to his website and to the design but he's kind enough in that tremendous um, ham radio spirit even though he's selling kits to, he's kind enough to actually put up the full schematic and the build instructions, um, um, as does Hans Summers and, and some of his designs as well, um, uh, which is so kind, really. So I've built a few of his designs. I've just scratch-built my own. Um, but this is for a, um, well, he calls it a 15 dB gain, low-noise, push-ball HF preamplifier. So it uses two uh, J310s. Um, and yeah, that gives me plenty of oomph, and it is low noise, uh, and it's it uses a couple of um, uh, transformers, as you can uh, uh, see here. One's got a binocular core, and one's just a, a regular kind of toroid. Um, and it, it yeah, it just works really well. And uh, I've used some of his um, his other amplifier designs before, so I knew that uh, I could uh, I could trust them. And uh, and with that in circuit. Um, uh, yeah, I've now got sufficient gain and uh, without having to crank the volume all the way up uh, up to the top. And, uh, and so that's it. So um, so what we got is we start off with the bandpass filter and then we go round to the RF preamp and that goes into the double balance diode ring mixer with the audio diplexer. Uh, and uh, which is also being fed from the glue stick PTO via the little buffer and that goes around there as well and finally then it all goes over to the souped up um, Pete Giuliano audio amplifier and uh, yeah as direct um, uh, conversion receivers go I'm pretty pleased with that um, I did play around with some uh, active 
uh, audio filtering as well, and, and maybe that's something for another day. But to be completely honest, um, uh, that is about as optimised uh, a, a DCR as uh, uh, as I'm going to go really. So I'm I'm quite pleased with that, and it's been really um, it's been really good fun. Uh, going back to the the fundamentals of this stuff and and looking at it again, so I hope you found this um, uh, 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 of of some interest as well. So that I think is China Radio International. Um, so I'm just sitting just north of the uh, UK allocation, the 40 meter band, and so uh, just above 7.2 megahertz. Um, but I'm going to tune down now. So I should be here in China Radio International because that's what frequency it's on. Uh, but I'm going to tune down. And you see, it's gone. And that didn't happen before I had the diplexer. So that's uh, really great. Not sure that there's much on. On 40 metres, right? So Yannis is on. He's always a strong signal. Not sure who else is on. So there we go. Um, hope you enjoyed that, and uh, hope it's encouraged uh, one or two to, to have a go at building their own direct conversion receivers um, using all analog bits, uh, all discrete components. It can be done, and it's great fun. And it, and it's uh, I've enjoyed looking back over it all and, uh, and and playing around with different designs. So. It only remains for me to thank you all and thank you for, for following me through this year and uh, and for those that have subscribed, thank you ever so much for that and uh, I wish you all a very, very happy Christmas and all the best for 2023. I will catch you again in the new year with some new projects and some more home brewing. But until then, look after yourselves. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.